Hello and welcome. Well, there's seldom that I am actually really honored to have two people on the panel to question and to pick their brains. These are two people that I and I think all of us here, we have students from all over the country, St. Stephen's, Delhi School of Economics, LSR, uh, all the top colleges uh, admire also. It's the RBI governor, so Raghuram Rajan, thank you very much for being with us. And his friend, uh, and who doesn't always, uh, doesn't always agree with him, uh, Arvind Subramanian, the Chief Economic Advisor of India. A round of applause for these two. I must say, I don't, know if I don't normally say this, but it is honestly great to have two great professionals respected around the world looking at the, running the economy of this country. Uh, the fact that it's in a mess is not your fault. <laughs> well, it's not in a mess, but do you always agree with each other on everything? You're friends, but it's like church and state. No, we, we, we do disagree. You yes. do disagree. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. On economic policy. Yeah. And sometimes even violently. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 this, but in a, in this is a larger scheme of things, yeah. not, not about current policy yeah. or right. you know, yeah. broadly about you know, way to growth in the long run and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if two quarters don't violently disagree on occasion, I, I think the output is much the lesser for it. They used to call it when we were on dialectics and you progress through dialectics, exactly. right? So in fact, actually, you've written a, a, quite a major paper together uh, when you were in the IMF, which caused a lot of controversy, and it was his fault, right? Yeah, he wrote the paper. <laughs> <laughs> now you're disowning it. <laughs> no, no, I, it, it's a very good paper, and uh, I, I. You're uh, co authors, though, right? We're co authors. We, we sort of wrote it together, but he, he did the bulk of the, the thinking and the work. Uh, but it was, uh, well, the story is it was uh, on aid and how aid really doesn't work in right. terms of economic growth. Yeah, it's useful in a calamity and so on. But somehow, for all the money that's poured in as aid, you really don't see strong evidence that it helps economic growth. Right. That's so pretty controversial when you're on the IMF well, giving aid. No, no, it's no. pretty controversial when you're in the IMF. It was worse. One week before the Glen Eagle Summit, yeah. when all the rich countries in the world are getting together to ramp and up, being pushed to ramp up, to aid. Ramp up aid. <laughs> and actually, the, the, the interesting story was that exactly uh, uh, the week before, I don't think Raghu remembers. Firstly, he's being very modest when he says uh, it was a joint uh, effort. And um, so uh, exactly four or five days before this major summit, 2005 right. Glen Eagles, the front page of the Financial Times, which is what everyone reads in Washington, right? The front page said, IMF says aid does not work. And, and, and Raghu doesn't remember this. He had actually left. On no, his, I remember that. He, he had gone off on tour. And so the managing director summoned the authors, <laughs> but one of them was missing. Uh, and then, that's so, lucky. So, so I had to go up and, and face the music. Uh, but uh, I, I think some 15 finance ministers from African countries called him that day. That day. <laughs> 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 to say, what, what are you, are you saying? Yeah. You know, the, the truth is the article reflected our views carefully. But this is something that people uh, should know. The headlines are not written by the person who interviews you. Yeah. No, no. The that's headlines right. are written by some Copy assistant editor. editor who wants to make make it look good. Right, right. And so, Pranoy should know. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've always said never trust journalists. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, the headlines weren't quite uh, that, but you got the gist. Got we wouldn't have gist. put it as as starkly. And you nearly and got the sack, the two of you. Well, uh, let's say we had some interesting conversations. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I, I had to uh, go and do a press conference to almost intellectually disown the paper. Oh, uh, no, but which I didn't. But I think we had to distance the IMF, the institution, right. from the authors. And it's always a tough act to do because, you know, after all, Raghu was the chief economist no, of the IMF. It's a bit, and difficult. It's, yeah, it's, it's a bit difficult to no, say that. But, but, the, but the truth is, actually, the IMF management supported it. Ah. They had seen the paper and they actually. Uh, said this was right and you know we had to figure out a way to 
the issue was the timing. The timing. <laughs> there, <laughs> there, Perfect the, timing the, from the, a journalist's point of view. And actually, think, to think, uh, thinking about it now, it's 10 years exactly since right. we wrote that paper. Uh, and, you know, I don't know whether, I think it, it's broadly, it's going to survive, uh, hopefully, I, I don't know. But uh, the, the really reassuring and comforting thing was that uh, the World Bank commissioned uh, a, a report by experts on uh, an evaluation of research done by the World Bank. Right. And Angus Deaton was on that right. committee. Right. And then he, I think, said basically that one of the, pro pro he said the best paper uh, done on aid was this paper that Raghun did. And he still stands by it and he teaches it in his class. Not so, bad. so that's the, uh, the vindication for that paper, for whatever it's worth. I mean. that's, not, that's not bad at all, but there you both agreed on one thing. Now, with, it's normal when you've got two economists, you'll have 20 views, right? And if you're Bengali economists, there'll be 50 views, <laughs> by and large. Neither of you are Bengali. Uh, no, no. <laughs> Actually, we're both from the same part of the world. <laughs> right, exactly. So let's, uh, one area which there's been some, I, I'm not sure who believes in what, but uh, there's some, I have a query in my mind about, do we have inflation or do we have disinflation or deflation? And it just depends on which data you look at. Let's have a look at how bizarre the two indices, the wholesale price index and the consumer price index. It's a crazy divergence. The wholesale price index says we have a minus 5% inflation or deflation and the, or disinflation. And the consumer price index says we have plus 5%. Now, only India can have two indices that say exactly the opposite thing. And you believe in the WPI and you believe in the CPI. <laughs> no, no, I think, I think that's not... Uh, 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 by the one last thing, yeah. the GDP deflator is about zero, halfway. Halfway to that. It's yeah. like exactly if you average the two. But that's almost by construction. So, so the real, uh, what uh, the National Income Accounts uh, Office, which by the way, they do a fantastic job in terms of procedure and institutions and credibility and so on. It's really a uh, top class operation and they're trying to upgrade it to world class standards. Um, they actually only measure wholesale and consumer prices. The GDP deflator is just a, it's just a just constructed. Derivative. Yeah, but I, I think that, uh, uh, on this, it's not that, first of all, it is very striking. It's not completely unprecedented, but the magnitude is unprecedented. Yeah. It's happened on a couple of occasions before. Yeah. And I think that it actually creates a very difficult problem for Raghu yes. and the RBI. Yes, because they yeah. both suggest very different, different policy script yeah. descriptions. A and just for the record, you know, it's not that I, I, I believe in WPI and Raghu believes CPI. I think we both believe probably, and Raghu correct me if I'm wrong, that both are conveying information about the economy. And the question is, therefore, how do you from this take out what's essential and then, you know, set interest rates or monetary policy, right. you know, given this bewildering, you know, divergence in information that's coming through. One example that if you take the CPI as the authentic measure of inflation, you are worried about inflation then. So you will not lower interest rates. If you think WPI is authentic, you will lower interest rates. You're not worried about inflation. Right. So a huge impact on policy. Right. No, so uh, we moved to targeting CPI uh, yes. some time back. And I think that's the right thing because that's what people see. Right. So what explains the divergence? I think it's basically differences in baskets. Yes. The WPI exactly. has a lot of traded goods, a lot of commodities. Manufacturing. Which are declining in price and therefore it's negative. The CPI has services and food, uh, food you know, held down by global prices, but services are unique in India. You can't get education services right. abroad, you have to get them in India. Right. You can't get healthcare abroad, you have to get it in India. So those have been inflating at a higher pace. So the difference really, I think, is the difference between non-traded goods, which are a larger part of CPI, and a right. smaller part of um, In a nutshell, what yeah. you're saying is that CPI, Consumer right. Price Index, has about 45, almost 50% right. food items, right. food and beverages. Right. While the wholesale price index has 65% manufactured items. Right. So one is almost for industry and one is almost for the consumer. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, but I think, I mean, so I, I... why, sorry, just one last thing. Why go for CPI when it's all about food and nothing the RBI can do much about food, more the monsoon? Well, it's not just about food. It's also, I mean, this is the thing that has a, had us worried and has us worried, which is right. services. But yeah. what's important is, uh, think of the wage price inflation uh, yes. issue. If we believe 
that people seeing the basket of goods they have to buy, see those, that basket higher in price, they want to have higher wages to, to, to be able to afford that. Right. So the spiral is not about commodities which some firm buys, right. but it's about what you go out into the market and buy. Right. That's what we have to combat as uh, you know, an inflation-focused central bank, right. one. Uh, two, it is a, uh, an issue that manufacturers might face a different level of inflation. But remember, it's not the negative five that you're pointing to, right. because even though the output prices are not uh, going up that much or may even be falling, the input prices, which are commodities, are falling even faster. faster. Yeah. So their profits are actually increasing. Right. So if you look at what they're trying to discount when they look at whether I should invest, it's the profitability. And that's you know a little better than where the WPI is, probably not as good as the CPI. So that's one. Don't feel that sorry <laughs> for the producer. He's He's not as well off, certainly. I mean, he must be worried that prices are going down because of lack of demand. Exactly. Kind of recessionary conditions. But that's so important for the RBI. Exactly. So, so what we have to do is continuously focus on that CPI, but say, how do we get to that target that we have in mind? Maybe if conditions are weaker, we take a little longer. That's how we set our inflation process. We took one year to get from, uh, in the initial years were easy, one year from double digit to eight, another year from eight to six, but now we're gonna take one year to get to five, and then another year to get to four. So it's it's gonna taper off the pace at which we, we try and hit the target. So, so, right, so right. The, the, I, I, the way I, I would, uh, uh, I mean, I, I think about this. The way this, you disagree. The way I, uh, Mars, <laughs> a, a little bit disagree is that. I'd love to hear your conversations in your room, actually. <laughs> much more violent. You know, I think that uh, firstly, they do convey uh, very different things. Um, and so in some sense, you know, the consumer is facing one set of prices and the producer, even uh, I think the adjustment that Raghu is saying is right. I mean, his profits are going up, but he is facing, you know, if you're selling steel, for example, you know, your, uh, your real interest rate is really very, very high today because the output of your steel is just plummeting yes. and even discounting for the fact that your inputs are cheaper, you know, you're really hurting. Um, so, so how should one, you know, digest all this information for, uh, you know, conduct monetary policy? And I think that, uh, I, I think Raghu is right that, you know, you, you've committed to the CPI. Uh, it's something that, you know, you should think. And by the way, I think that, uh, you know, uh, the way I would defend the CPI, even, and, and you make a good point, Pranoy, by saying that, you know, so much is goods, you know, what do you control? But actually... So much is agriculture. So agriculture, food, yeah. so you don't control it very much. Right. But actually... What you do control is, you know, if consumers are looking at this price and they say, should I keep my money in the financial sector, in banks, or should I put it in, in this, they look at the CPI. So by, by adjusting interest rates, you do affect consumer decisions in terms of, you know, which can affect inflation. You know, if they put money in the bank, that's good because inflation will come down, they're saving more. So, so the, but the way I, I would, uh, you know, uh, I, and I've been, you know, we've had this discussion is that, you know, you have this inflation target, but it's a flexible inflation target. It's not that, you know, you have to reach this thing at this point in time that Therefore, what this extra information WPI is conveying some more information about the economy. In, in this case, as you say, economy is very weak in some senses. Therefore, we should exploit the flexibility to design monetary policy to take account of this extra yes, information. I mean, that's the point uh, uh, he must be putting to you a lot, that there's recession, that nobody's buying stuff from industry, cars are not, nobody, uh, the output is dropping. And you're looking at CPI and saying prices are too high. So, no, what so, about? So I, I, I'm saying if we can't bring inflation down under these circumstances, then we really will have an inflation problem <laughs> when things get better. So the, the point is that yes, we've given some leeway for the condition of the economy, and clearly we're looking at the conditions of the economy when we determine interest rate policy. Right. But the point is, with all these positives behind us. WPI at negative five and so on. And that's a shocker. We have to be able to bring inflation under control because over time things will just get tougher if the world economy starts growing, there's inflation elsewhere. The, the other way of looking at this is what WPI is saying is the world has controlled inflation or in fact engendered deflation at negative five, right? right? We can't sort of beat our, you know, beat our chest and say, yeah, we did negative five, it's all because of us. It's because of the world. 
What is because of us? That's six and seven. That's services. So what Except we need? I would say, wouldn't you say that the world has helped us get to minus five, and the monsoons made us go plus five in <laughs> CPI? A bad uh, monsoon will. I mean, I, 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 I just think, I think food prices over the last year have contributed uh, some. They're about but forty-five percent weight. Weight, but but in, in they've been very the contained. But they've been very contained. Yeah. But there too, I mean, I think a combination of the world and the government. Have helped keep uh, uh, have helped keep uh, food prices down as well. I, I think it, there's food a food management has uh, been very good. Uh, so I think the government Except, should get a lot of credit. And I've just been on a pulses, pulses. long trip on Bihar, pulses and all everybody is talking about yeah. is dal, and that's affecting inflationary right. expectations. Right. Let's have a look at what inflationary expectations are right now. All this effort, but still we're not able to control inflation uh, expectations. They're rising. Uh, it's, is it that is that the dal effect? Salient goods, absolutely. Uh, when you ask the man on the street, what do you think inflation is? He'll pick a number which, you know, the average number is number we haven't actually touched in terms of inflation right. over the last <laughs> five years, right? Yeah, yeah. But really, the number that he he or she picks is based on what they bought last, which right. typically are things like, as you said, dal, onions. milk, eggs, onions. So. It's salient uh, stuff which stays in their mind and they say, oh my God, this has gone up so much. Much of what they pick out typically has some fluctuations. They go up, but they also come down. Yeah. And they don't really yeah. seem to pick up the down no, phase. No, no. <laughs> but when it's up, it really, really and strikes And by the way, them. seasonality is huge in these. Absolutely. It's a 20% change from the lean yeah. months to the harvest months. I, th I think on the dal effect and you know, hitherto the onion effect, you know, right. I think it's it's kind of uh, interesting, and 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 you know I, th I think there is some psychological salience behavior going on, but I think it also connects with the point that you began with the divergence, because the question is that why is there so much divergence? After all, if wholesale prices are coming down, at some stage you should reflect that also in you know the ability of you know that basically means that manufacturers don't have uh, producers don't have a lot of power, bargaining power, which means that eventually consumer prices should also come down. So it's saying something about the you know parts of the Indian economy, which is kind of a little bit. And there, I think it's also saying that in agriculture, like you know, certainly in the case of f vegetables and, and fruits, that we're not a single market, that there are these rigidities of movements across things. Right. Therefore, shortages at some place get magnified and distorted in another place, uh, which I think we need to address. And I think the Dal effect is something that I I relates to long-term agricultural policy. You know, how is, I mean, how are we going to address the I fact see, that's that- that's an important issue. Yeah. Every year something pops up. It's onions, Dal, could be tomatoes, could be anything. And we don't seem to be able to control that. It gets out of control, and then it takes us a long time to import. How do we, well, we can't we, we plan ahead for this sort of thing? I, I, when, I, when I said food management is better, mm -hmm. uh, one of the uh, things we manage to control is grains. I mean, uh, rice, wheat. Right. And that's partly because of, buffer stocks. of moderation in, uh, in uh, minimum support prices. Also because world uh, prices are relatively moderate, we can import. But it's important to control these because these are the things we procure most of. Right. So when the farmer is thinking about what to plant, he says, well, this is a sure shot. Yeah. I, can, I can plant it and I can actually sell it to the government if need be. For the other stuff, we set prices, but we don't procure so much. Right. And as a result, there's a there's greater risk, focus on this. Yeah. And, and the fact that we produce too much of this is reflected in our huge buffer stocks. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. in unnecessarily big. We don't Absolutely. need that kind of buffer so stock. So we're moving more towards affecting. We affect cropping pattern yeah. by making it less uncertain to use, uh, grow wheat or rice. Right. right. And and by keeping those moderate, right. but increasing, say, the price of pulses, you give farmers more of an incentive to shift. Yes. Which, in the longer run, we really need. In fact, we need market forces to work. What right. does the public want? They should produce more of that. Yes. So. The, the way to do that is to keep minimum support prices below the market price. So they're, they're really a support price rather than the market price, which right. is what they'd become for some. Right. And I to make it across other commodities as well, which you want to encourage. Yeah, but I, I think that, you know, the way I think about uh, agriculture and, and the, you know, I think there are two distinct policy issues here. Uh, I think there's the, you know, the, the cropping pattern, 
grains versus proteins. And remember, uh, Angus Deaton has this excellent uh, research which shows that in India, you know, incomes have risen, therefore the demand for protein has risen. And we actually consume much less cereals than we would have had some historical pattern been followed. So protein is going to become, and as vegetarians, pulses are going to be, become very important. Right. So important, we need to plan yeah, for that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so the pulses problem has to relate to prices, to technology, and so on. But then we have this fruit and vegetable problem, which is a slightly different problem. There, it's not this, you know, long run, how do we boost supply kind of thing. It's about how we make India a common market, you know, because, you know, there are states which produce this, but because of restrictions across states, I think it can't, the, the, the stuff can't get to markets on time. Right. You know, I, I, I like to say in the economic survey, I said that, you know, in agriculture, we're not one, but we're like 5,000 countries. Because there are 5,000 agricultural well, markets. Can I just ask both of you one, thing which one excuse which is always made for uh, any individual prices of a commodity going up which is ridiculous is that it's the hoarders I mean they're blamed you know it's not our fault but shall we just say that's rubbish once and for all I'll let the government view <laughs> <laughs> that answers the question I think <laughs> No, I, I think that, you know... Uh, uh, as an the, economist. As an economist. Uh, uh, and uh, I, I think the thing to, to understand is, you know, we have to understand, you know, what leads How to... How to pass the blame to somebody else. Well, uh, that's <laughs> one way of looking at it. I, I think that, you know, we have to, you know, think about, you know, what information our price is conveying. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, therefore, yeah. you know, if they're conveying that there's shortages, that means something. And, yeah. you know, there are different ways of approaching the problem. And I think that... I think we, we have, so at, yeah, we have to that's look at yeah. We have to look at you know the long run uh, impacts of these things right. as well. Yeah. That's very well put. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any questions on inflation? Anybody who's from Delhi School of Economics <coughs> and who's a Bengali gets priority. Anybody? No question on inflation. You know they don't suffer from <laughs> price rise. They're just way it's above. It's history now. <laughs> 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 yeah, there, 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 there is an inflation question. problem. There is a question there. Yeah. There is yes. a question. Yes. Please yes, go ahead. Please. It's a well-known fact that inflation now is well under control, but, but is it still sustainable enough to survive another rate cut if it happens anytime soon? <laughs> so y this is an indirect way of telling, asking me whether we're going to cut rates. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> uh, You're you not know, as dumb as I look. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what what uh, we said in, in our monetary policy statement is we've uh, essentially looked at all the room we had and uh, you know, taken full advantage. So uh, until more room builds up, and we said we are data dependent, uh, I think we're comfortable with where we are. I, I actually have to remind uh, Raghu that he's forgotten his own monetary policy statement, and let me remind him oh. that he also said that the stance of policy is accommodative going forward, which kind of speaks to the question that you asked, th that what he's saying is that, you know, uh, uh, that he's open, I mean, or the uh, RBI is open to more, uh, and uh, so, so it's not shut out, you know, f for good or even for the near term, more interest rate cuts, but he's open, and as the data come along on prices and on, you know, how the economy is doing, uh, he will consider it, but he's basically accommodative, if I may remind <laughs> you of that, right? <laughs> accommodative, that's <laughs> a crucial I, I, I agree with the word accommodative. <laughs> <laughs> I have one suggestion which just occurred to me that, you know, we do a lot of sampling and uh, we add samples from different places and uh, we do some econometrics. You can add both the indices together and their weights will automatically be adjusted. You'll get a bigger sample of, uh, so you get food plus manufactured goods. So if you do CPI and WPI together, you may get a better overall picture of inflation. Maybe, but, but remember the CPI is based on what the consumer buys, right? Yeah. So if you're really interested in protecting the consumer right. and thereby, you know, uh, worrying about either his investment decisions or his consumption decisions, I think that the CPI is probably what you should be looking at rather than intermediate prices. Okay. Um, Another area which is worrying, uh, industry is of course in, 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 in terrible shape. They're crying out for something, they're not responding and it is really awful to hear politicians say, come on, do something, get off your backsides industrialists, don't work like that. They need signals, they need incentives, they're dying to do something. And part of the problem of course is the weakest 
ever that the global economy has been since the crisis. We're growing the whole economy. Global economy is growing at 2.5%. That's very, very weak. So our exports are plummeting. Let's have a look at our exports at the moment. Month after month, exports are going more and more negative. In September, they're minus 24%. And uh, I think both of you, again, have slightly different views on this. What does this mean about the exchange rate? Is the rupee too high? Let's have a look at how we how the rupee, the rupee has fallen against the dollar. But what's more important, has it fallen against other emerging markets? Just have a look at that. Versus South Africa, the rupee has gone up by 30%. Versus Brazil, up by 36%. Versus Russia, up. The rupee has gone up, not gone down, by 49%. How do you compete? Even versus Indonesia, it's up by 7%. Versus Turkey, 19%. Versus Mexico, 13%. Should the rupee be lowered? I hate to use devalue. That's like a hangover from the past, a bad word. Yeah, but, but to can, make us more competitive. Yeah, can, can we go back to the previous chart? I, I think yes. it's also the uh, plummeting exports. So yeah. We can just have a look can at. Can we have a look? Because I think this is important for this audience. You know, uh, what uh, the, the headline sensationalism that Pranoy uh, indulges in, and, and, and what the what reality is. What was the one they gave for you? <laughs> a doesn't work. Yeah. So, so, exports are plummeting. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so if you look at this this thing, and and it looks really, you know, it really looks. Uh, uh, horrendous, disastrous. disastrous. Yeah. But actually, you have to correct for two things in this. Why this is, you know, first of all, this is all exports, and you know, we export a lot of oil-related <laughs> products as well. So, so the fact that oil prices have come down, we benefit I can't a lot. Believe of you're saying that we used to say we can't devalue because we import so much oil. Now we are exporting oil. No, no, no. Because no, no uh, the point I'm making is that you know, non-oil exports. Because we're benefiting from the oil, yeah, yeah. has come down by much less than what this is suggesting. Okay. Yeah, it's very important. It's, it's a huge right, correction. Right, right. The second thing you have to remember is that, you know, in a sense, just uh, as Raghu said earlier, the world prices are coming down enormously. So that if you were to say what is actually not the value of non-oil imports, but actually in terms of actual volumes, you know, how many cars, how many tons of steel, you know, how many aluminum, whatever ingots are coming in, that number is actually very different. Uh, it would be something like, coming you know. Coming in, imports, you mean. Uh, sorry, going, going out, going out, out okay, yeah. sorry. So the export, so the, the true measure of exports is, you know, much less forbidding than what you're so that's just a lesson in economics which for for Very whatever it's worth yeah. uh, but, but but that being said it is true Still that the, negative, wo yeah. the world economy is and of course a, a lot of this but is that's hurting indian industry that's right? hurting indian industry and, and therefore the question is to the extent that it is a problem and we have to understand how much is beyond our control and how much is within mm. our control uh, then we have to see what instruments we have right and i think we have you know uh, uh, a, a number of instruments one is that you know this is where I think the Make in India uh, uh, you know, campaign of, of, the, of the Prime Minister is very important. Because I read that above all is as how do we make the economy competitive in, in the medium to long run? Because that's fundamentally what's going to get our exports up. Right. right. That's the, that's the medium term. And price. So you the know, other thing. And the control, other thing yes. I'm going to come to. The other thing, which of course is the knee-jerk short-term reaction, is oh, let's give favors to you know sp specific exporters. You know, the steel guys are hurting. Give them some subsidies. You know, or give them some protection. And I think there we have to be a bit careful. We have to balance the benefits possibly of giving protection against the cost. But I think the the, the and, last and the cost would be that your you could have industries that use that commodity as an input. And you put tariffs very high, then your car exports fall off because now steel is very costly for the car exporters. So th right. there's a balancing so act. So that, that's very yes, yes. But, but, the, but the point about the exchange and, and targeting individuals yeah, yeah, yeah. is a little bit interfering yeah. with the market and you know. And, and also it becomes discretionary and then yes. you know, uh, and yes. you know, it creates all the problems that we know happen with these things. But then the, the third instrument we have is the exchange rate. Right. And, and I think that, uh, uh, you know, uh, to the extent possible, uh, I think we have to maintain uh, our, our, our competitive exchange rate. That's the experience from China and all the East Asian countries that did. But the question is that, you know... Just, just to stop you there. Yeah. Competitive exchange rate. We're seeing our exchange rate is becoming less and less competitive with many other emerging markets. And if you look at the overall emerging market index, our exchange rate is becoming more and more non-competitive. So I know it's politically very difficult to say, yes, the rupee should go down to 70, 75, 80. It sounds like it's terrible. But if that keeps us in parity with emerging markets, 
shouldn't we do what's best? Uh, yeah, but there, I think, Pradoy, I, and I think uh, Raghu will, will respond to this. I, I think that on the no, one hand... You didn't uh, say agree with No, this. no, on, on the one hand, I do think that we have to uh, maintain a competitive exchange rate. Mm -hmm. But I think, how do you get it in the face of, you know, a global economy we're part of and in the face of all these inflows that are coming in. You know, if we can, by magic, you know, over time, maintain a gradual, you know, improvement in competitiveness, i.e. gradual depreciation, uh, it would be great. But then, you know, uh, if suddenly markets say, oh my God, you know, this is an economy that's, you know, uh, you know the exchange rate's coming down, there are all these other problems, let's exit, panic. And then you get these disruptive movements of the exchange rate, which are then very damaging for everything. Right. So you have to balance you that. Have to balance. Yeah. But bottom line, should we try and be competitive with our Comp competitors. Well, first, I think those uh, numbers again are a little <laughs> misleading. Uh, partly but because you're two for two today. Numbers you're, be misleading. you're two for two today. I think, uh, <laughs> I'm in deep uh, problem. I, I'll, right? I'll, I'll take your your nominal uh, uh, differences for for granted. But right. remember, now Russia has a pretty serious inflation problem yeah. because the currency has depreciated so much. Right. Similarly, Brazil. Brazil is combating a, right. a higher level of in though they started out at a lower level of inflation right. than we did. So. Uh, what that is doing is offsetting any competitive advantage right. there. And that, that's a point to, that's to a note point, yes. that uh, the industrial countries, because their central banks have credibility, because they don't have as many frictions in the economy, seem to be able to depreciate their currency and get a competitive advantage from that which is significant. So, you know, the euro area is one example where they seem to be doing better as a result of the fall in the euro. But for emerging markets, there's always the risk that whatever short-term advantage you get is offset by seriously higher inflation over the medium term, which negates everything that you've done. And this was the Italian issue, right? right. I Italy used to have this history when it had the lira yes. of doing a sharp depreciation, get an advantage for six months, and then see inflation come back yes. and negate and that. So they had to, to continuously depreciate, right. absolutely. And so then the question is, which do you prefer? Uh, inflation over the medium r o and the long run, or do you try and do it through all the other means, get competitiveness through the means that Arvind talked about, which is improve your make in India capabilities, improve your business regulation, well, you know, infrastructure. Some of that may happen. Didn't they say, somebody say in the long run we're all dead? No, uh, see, I, I, just I, one I, more thing on no, that. On Jacobs. Even if you depreciate today, let's say we got no, a 15%. I think, I think it's, it's what you're saying, I, I totally agree with, but it's taking an extreme position, take a sharp depreciation. Yeah. But, you know, you're a, a professional that everybody knows can handle it slowly over time. So should we be slowly under control, just keeping up our competitiveness? Well, I think if, so first, there another element to competitiveness which is missing here, which is productivity growth. Right. So to the extent that we have stronger productivity growth, we can stay with a, a nominal exchange rate which would otherwise be overvalued. Right. But put everything together, and this goes back to Arvind's other point, mm. that when you look at volume of exports, the volume of exports hasn't fallen off tremendously. And in fact, compared to our peers, everybody's suffering on exports. Yes. Compared to our peers, it doesn't look like we are an outlier. So, in a broader sense, we are maintaining competitiveness. So, you say our exchange rate is fine as it is, it's the right spot? I, that's what I always say. Wherever it is, it's, it's the fine. right place. <laughs> uh, you know, or, or, or the other way of saying it is that, is that if you ask an, uh, well, if you ask a, a, an industrialist or, you know, uh, is that what is the uh, uh, best level of the exchange rate, he will always say 20% below the current level, you know. So, I think because he'll always want to come. But I think... Oh, 20% below. Yeah, he won't value, yeah, value exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. But I, I think that one thing I think we uh, um, miss out on all this, and I think this is a, a macroeconomic point that I find it very difficult to get across in India, you know, uh, at all levels, you know. Mm. Uh, hopefully not at your level, but at all <laughs> levels, uh, is that when you talk about managing this and how do you get it down to wherever you want to, what complicates that considerably is that we are op relatively open to capital. If capital starts flooding in, 
what is poor Raghu to do? Because when capital comes in, the yes. pressure is for the thing to go up and up and up. Right. And remember, our system seems to think that more foreign capital always at all times in all forms is an unambiguous good. But I think at some deep level, there is a tension between saying, let's get all the capital we want and make in India and competitive because the more it comes in, the more the it's more going to put the... Uh, 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 it's a lot of paper we wrote together. Yeah, it was <laughs> <of> paper. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, and so and then, therefore, therefore yeah. it's a problem. It's not easy and therefore, you know, we should never forget so that. Uh, the kind of vibes I'm getting is that on e interest rates, you'd like him to be accommodative and on exchange rate, he'd like you to be a little accommodative. <laughs> <laughs> But, but, but of course, uh, as all of you should say that interest rates and exchange rates are related, you know, it's not, of there's course, no, yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. Uh, I do, I have reported on China since they used to wear Mao tunics and the f factories were like Russian factories. I used to film them. Then I saw the first golf course, the first McDonald's. They had a big McDonald's and across the road they had Deng Xiaoping blessing it and I did a piece to camera. I see. And I used to watch the amount of foreign capital that used to come in in those days, $80 billion, $100 billion a year, we're nowhere near that. Yeah, and it, many people say that added 2 3%, we're going to say the same thing. 2 we're 3 percent to their growth say, rate. I'll let you say 3 4 percent to their growth rate? We may not say the same thing, but <laughs> the, way they, the way they dealt with that was sending it back out. They built $4 trillion worth of reserves, right. low yielding reserves. So this is the Chinese uh, poor Chinese family, in effect, building assets against industrial countries. Now, how much that uh, sa extra saving uh, sort of has hurt their longer run consumption prospects, now China is interestingly moving in a significant way to enhancing domestic consumption. Right. Because it right. views that as the more stable way of no, growth. Uh, right. No, but uh, he didn't say what uh, what I was hoping he'd say, and, and you know I want to. Is that <laughs> when you talk about the he eighty? Seems pleased that he didn't say yeah, what exactly. you wanted. <laughs> you know, the eighty billion that came in. You know, all that Raghu is talking about the pushing out thing. It's happened in the last ten years. But you go back to seventy nine. The kind of capital that China got was not funny money and speculative capital. No. It was hardcore investments, investments. in factories and Coca -Cola yeah, factory, FDI. You know? kind of, yes, and exactly. FDI is a good thing. But what we're talking about is the other stuff, you know, the, the, the borrowing that we do in foreign currency, you know, the speculative capital that comes in. You know, we have to be much more careful. And China, even today, it does not allow these things. I think on allowing these things in, we are much more open than China is. But, but this is one place where he and I, I think, are a little, uh, uh, we differ a little. I am more open to the idea that foreign capital is beneficial, especially in India where risk capital is hard to find. And so, you know, there's a lot more money which has gone into the stock market over the years. Of course, they expect a return and they should. But they are also providing that equity buffer, which we so desperately need in our companies. Often you find that going to Indian sources for that, that, that risk capital is very hard. Most Indian sources want debt. Right. And so right. I, I think there is a valuable role that they play. Private equity is playing a val valuable role. It's not just FDI, but other forms of foreign but, but, capital. But, uh, but just to, uh, to finish this exchange, but Raghu, also remember, you know, in the go-go years of when the infrastructure boom happened, lots of these infrastructure companies borrowed in foreign currency. I, they took dollar loans, which is, in, I, I think there we'd both agree, amongst the forms of capital, that's the most pernicious. Right. They got this. So they had borrowings in dollars. They were selling power and everything which is rupees. When the exchange rate went down, their borrowing costs ballooned, inflated. Right. And, and a lot of com companies yeah, are suffering, uh, suffering from, that. from that. Exactly. Yeah. Even today we yeah. face the hangover yeah. of that. Yeah. So we have to be ca very careful about what kinds of foreign, foreign capital. capital. But both of you agree that foreign direct investment into factories, into creating assets good. is unambiguously good. And we're at what, 30, 40 billion? And China used to be 20 years ago 80 billion. Yeah, so we should try and raise it from 30, 40 billion to 100 billion today. Yeah, absolutely. I, I in I, FDI. In FDI. Uh, FDI and on yeah, the exactly. exchange rate, there's a question from uh, Nikum's Jain from St. Stephen's. You're there. Okay. Lal Sitara Jitega. So my question to you is that uh, today the U.S. Treasury has a lot of debt in the international market in the order of trillions of dollars, and China holds 20% of this. However, it's public knowledge that they cannot back up what they've printed. And they still continue to print this, right? So today, if everybody who holds a dollar note goes to them and asks for it back, 
and i say everybody i don't even mean 100% i mean they cannot back up half of that so uh, my question to you is with so many emerging markets coming up and so many more players on the international level will we see a paradigm shift from the dollar as an international standard to maybe other currencies which are net exporters or which can actually back up their debt um you're asking a somewhat philosophical question on what it means to back debt i mean technically they can they just print dollars and the federal reserve has a printing press and and they can print as many dollars as they want to pay down the debt uh and and that would be legal because they paying what it says is i will pay you back dollars because they don't issue in euros they don't issue in rupees so that's the value of having a reserve currency it's also a value we have because we can issue debt in rupees and when somebody comes for that their money we print more rupees and give it to them the key question you're asking is should people uh, be confident that they won't in some way inflate away their debt because they don't have the resources the underlying resources and they're printing money beyond what they 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 can actually produce in a sense and the answer is the us does enjoy that confidence today so it may not be running a current account surplus uh but there is certainly uh, no belief in world markets that the us will default uh, on its debt through a high inflation that's why it's it's a reserve currency uh of course if the us fiscal situation went way out of whack or there was a sense they would never get their entitlements under control With the biggest source of problem for the us long term is that they have obligations on healthcare and social security not so much the pensions. public debt no. the pensions and uh, and uh, so i think that they have to bring that under control there are many people in the united states who are worrying about that issue but so long as the world has confidence that some day they will bring that under control there's no worry about the us defaulting on the on the debt as far as other countries go yes over time as their markets become more liquid as going in and out of the currency becomes easier they will become more of a reserve currency we are taking small steps along the way of course keeping in mind arvin's point that we don't need a whole lot of foreign capital coming in today but you know rupee bonds the so called masala bonds can now be issued abroad we are fairly open to foreign investors coming into our equity markets we've been a little more cautious about them coming into debt markets so over time as we become more confident as our own domestic markets deepen we will almost surely become a reserve currency yeah uh, so so on on that it's it's a great question by the way the, i i think that uh, because there are only because he's from sense no no because <laughs> there are, there are, there are many kind of interesting issues that that, that raises so so one of my uh, you know I, i've written done some work on china and one of my predictions is that by you know by 2030 the the the, the chinese currency will overtake the dollar as the premier reserve currency uh, maybe i'll be uh, wrong on that it's always uh, safe to make long term like, predictions exactly yeah. <laughs> yeah but 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 i think the the, the interesting question here is that you know well, that's interesting yeah yeah china actually really resents the fact that you know the dollar is the, is the reserve currency of the world and they're doing everything to try and make their currency also attain that status but the irony is that in the last 5 6 7 10 years the period that he was saying the country that's been most responsible to keeping the dollar as the reserve currency are the chinese because they've been buying up this uh, all these dollars and propping it up but the second irony is of course that in the world today by acquiring all these reserves dollar dollar in in, in fact i would say today that china has more dollars to throw around than even the US Federal Reserve which for all kinds of political reasons you know it can't print as much as it would like to for political reasons but china has been using these 4 trillion dollars to gain a whole lot of geopolitical advantage yes. and it, there are lots of ironies in this yeah right, right. And, and and hopefully at some stage we'll also become a reserve currency but uh, you know let's let's wait let's wait that you're not saying 2030 no not 2030 <laughs> i don't even want it to be a reserve currency by 2030 because i think that it means that we'll have to you know open up in a way that you know may not be always be yeah. desirable yeah. for make in india for example just one more thing on the exchange rate and uh, in the old days nobody used to say you can't uh, let the rupee slide slide i hate the word slide devalue sound you know become more competitive plummet, yeah. plummet. <laughs> <laughs> because of oil we import so much oil will die now oil prices are ridiculously low and the criticism of uh the establishment is that you're not 
making use of the oil dividend, the oil bonanza. That from $120 to $50, and we're an oil importing country, this is the time to just boost industry, make the economy grow faster. We haven't seen any, no impact. I think, is it, I don't think it's completely fair to say that. We, I think, let me say two or three. One is that the fact that oil prices have come down it's has wonderful for us. Right? No, has uh, and actually has allowed us to reduce subsidies, has allowed us to you know get get more tax revenues, which in fact we have used in the budget to divert to public investment. So uh, I, I think that had oil prices not gone down, you know, maintaining macro stability, a, a prudent budget deficit, and providing money for public investment. By the way, which is one of the motors of the Indian economy today. I mean, you know, right. exports are down. Private investment is down, but you know uh, uh, the oil price effect in some ways, and all that the government and the RBI have done. You know, oil prices have come down; it's put more money in people's pockets. So private consumption—it's like a tax cut. So private consumption, urban consumption, has gone up. Has it really? I mean, yeah, yeah. Well, the uh, demand uh, doesn't seem to have. So it's a bit. No, no. But I, I, I think really that I, I think leverage that tremendous uh, 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 opportunity. No, but uh, the other thing is that on the fiscal side, we've actually provided more money. In fact, public investment uh, in the first half of the year has grown up by something like 17, 18 percent. And okay, that's kind I of do have a, a question yeah. on that, which I think since you're criticizing, uh, criticizing him on interest rates. He may criticize you on government spending sure. in a few minutes, a few minutes from now. Overall, the, the biggest area facing a problem is industry today. I know you look at consumers, but the industrialists sure. are kind of like the, uh, they're a signal, they're the early signs of a reviving economy. Let's have a look at the problems that industry is facing today. And it's really serious in India. First of all, there's signs of a crisis. There's a headline for you. Uh, latest quarter, two out of three companies miss their sales targets. That is two out of three, almost unprecedented. The growth rate of industry is 5%. I'm talking about China in those days, 18%, 19% indust industrial growth rate. Extremely poor job creation in the, in the organized sector. Only 64,000 jobs in quarter one of 2015. Uh, shockingly low. It has, so there's no way out. Falling exports, we've talked about, maybe 24% is a little too high given inflation differences. Uh, competitiveness, we are now 130 out of 186. We've improved by 10. Wow, man, we've gone from 140 to, you know what, we are in football, I think we're about 120. <laughs> we're the 120th best footballing country and we're the 130th most competitive country and the 56 below us are not very important countries. And then, of course, the high debt that all industries, particularly infrastructure. So industry today is crying. And are we doing enough about it? If we just look quickly at um, one thing you could do is lower interest rates, of course. The other thing you could do is uh, quantitative easing, more government expenditure. But the data shows the government expenditure has been dropping. Just have a look at the percentage of GDP, the government expenditure which in a way contributes to so growth. And by the way, that graph could have been much more. They should learn to draw graphs with the, so it looks as though it's falling faster. <laughs> From about 17% to 13.5% of GDP. We have done no, no, haven't met our disinvestment targets this year. We are not, uh, I think the only area which is doing reasonably well is road construction. But government spending to boost the economy, which is your area, not only your area, I mean, there are many, industry, many uh, ministries, is not boosting the economy. So it's not just interest rates. So I think you've asked two questions. Uh, you know, one is on 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 manufacturing, and the yes, other on, yes, on, on yes, government. Yes. So I don't know how you'd like to take it. Uh, you know, which. Uh, so let me uh, talk about uh, private uh, the manufacturing side. Right. Uh, I think I think it's well identified problem is uh, you've. Uh, but I, I would s see it slightly differently. Okay. I think the problem, one of the pro challenges of the Indian economy today is that private investment is, is somewhat weak. 
and, and I think you know there are many reasons for this, but part of the problem is that balance sheets of the private sector are strained. Uh, and a, a, a big you mean a lot of debt, a lot of debt, low profitability, yeah, a and it seems to be concentrated in a few sectors and in a few groups of companies, and and I think that's uh, uh, important to note. Um, so what's happening is that because they have so much debt, because they weak, they can't invest, and of course part of the problem is this is partly a legacy from the go-go years of the 2000s when there was a lot of you know expectations of high growth they over leveraged themselves and now the, in some senses part of the chickens are coming home to roost so i think that the challenge is how do we clean up the balance sheet of the firms and associated how we also then clean up the balance sheet of the banks because i think unless we solve those twin problems private investment going forward will remain weak uh, and so we, we can talk about that. But then that leads to, therefore, if private investment is going to remain weak, how much should the government do to offset that? So what, should, what should he do? <laughs> uh, Wake I, up and do something. I, <laughs> I think the government is. He's telling you to lower interest rates and boost industry. What you should, what you should, should well, we be telling him? I, I think the government uh, said it was going to do more spending and certainly in the road sector has picked up. Uh, railways, there's some hope that it will pick up very soon. So these are the right things to be done. The pace at which it comes in is, is important, but, uh, but it's, in, it's underway. It's underway. Right. The uh, point that Arvind made uh, is, is important, that there are certain sectors that are highly overlevered, that are, uh, you know, have Leverage stopped investing, just for the too much debt. Yeah. And uh, because they have enormous debt service problems, they can't attract any new financing, and uh, they can't invest. That's one. Uh, but also remember, we've had two bad monsoons. And so agricultural dem demand from the rural areas is also relatively weak. Yes. So foreign demand weak, that's what you pointed to earlier. Right. Rural demand weak. Investment, uh, at least private investment, still to take off. Right. So overall, when companies, even regular companies, not in infrastructure, not in the yes. stuff that benefited from the go-go years, are looking at, at demand, they say not enough. Right, which is part of the reason we actually cut interest rates as much as, as we did most recently when people expected a lower rate cut. But given that, I think there are some signs of, of things starting to pick up, of demand starting to pick up. Look at the auto sector, 22% growth uh, month on uh, year on year. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are some signs that at least urban demand is starting to get more confident, perhaps on the ba basis of higher incomes, lower outgoes because of fuel and so on. Isn't that a bit optimistic? I mean, no, no. It, well, I the, mean, most these industrialists say, man, whatever you're doing, you're not doing it right. Well, we're just not. And, and, tell me and a this situation. Is off the record. I've the, been in the finance ministry myself. When have they ever said you're doing great? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not, not so much. I think they're always uh, fairly uh, complimentary. Uh, it's more that. No, that's, that's true. They'll be complimentary to you. But what do they say when you're not in the room? No, no. Yeah. <laughs> They, they always talk about the difficulty of their situation, of yes, course. Right. And uh, I, th I think both of us are very sympathetic to the view that it Things is a very bad, difficult situation. Very right and now. coming off right. uh, a period when they were really uh, going, growing gangbusters and suddenly being hit with a, you know, almost a sudden stop in terms of what yes, they... Yes, so yes. it is a very difficult situation. I think government, RBI, all of us recognize it. But we have to operate within the tools that we have. Uh, you can't. So couldn't the no, finance ministry or the government do something more? Yeah, I, I think. But, okay. but how much? You can't answer that. Question. No, no, I, I want to. <laughs> no, the, the, the real question is, in terms of space, monetary and fiscal stimulus, I think we're both doing as much as we can, given the need to maintain macro stability. So what is left is, can we crank up the pace of structural reforms? In the financial sector, we're looking at that. So yeah. all these new banks coming up. Uh, yeah. The Bandhan Bank, for example, is hiring a lot of people. IDFC is hiring a lot of people uh, to do what they're going to do. Right. And similarly, all these new payment banks, small finance banks, they will start hiring. That will help economic growth. The what should they do? Well, as I said, the public investment that they're trying to crank up but it's not coming. getting cranked up. You no, saw no, that no, no. I, I think that uh, again, uh, if I may say so, uh, you know, uh, sensational. No, no, it's not. It is. I think. Remember that public investment 
not just roads but also railways is is picking up and you know and both are contributing to you know in the first six months we've actually growth has been like 18 percent roads railways everything and uh, it's we've spent about 53 percent of our year budget and remember uh, this public investment is good for the private sector because it's creating the capacity and the infrastructure that will crowd in private investment. But uh, I want to make a, 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 a larger point, you know, please, it's, it's, please, a, it's a corrective to your uh, uh, unremitting little bit, you know, gloom that you're, that you're trying to uh, 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 perpetrate. I, I think that... <laughs> so that I'm just reflecting what yeah, I, I hear, I, honestly, and I've heard industrialists all for many years, 20 years. I have really not heard them, and they don't say this to you, really, because they a little no, bit scared. See, I, it is like desperate right no, now. No, but I think we need a sense of perspective here. Right. I mean, think about it, right? Despite the fact that the world is, you know, demand is collapsing. Yes. Despite the fact that, you know, private investment is like this, we are, you know, growing robustly. You know, think of it, you know, when we grew at 10, nine and a half, 10 percent in the go-go years, our exports were growing at 30 percent. Right. Despite export growth being zero percent, we are doing, you know, seven, seven and a half, eight, whatever it is going to be in that seven and a half, eight range. And we are By doing which that series. We talk. And we no, we'll talk come, about we'll that come later. later. <laughs> but we'll come to that later. And, and you have to see this in international perspective. Remember, the world is slowing down. Everyone's slowing down. And in that, we are rightly seen as a haven of macro stability and a real haven of investment opportunity because we represent, you know, it's one of the what you're saying, because. Yeah. That's all very true. We are a haven of uh, micro stability. Thanks to both of you, seen as prophet. I think the best thing any government's ever done is to appoint the two of you. And I'm not. I say that even when you're not in the room. But the issue is, they're also talking about, and they've said it openly, and one or two have said it on camera, even though they're a little scared about what in people loved about India, why they liked it. Investing is the stability and the democracy, the tolerance the acceptance of all different religions, castes, you know, everybody is living together. It's different from the rest of the world. Now they're worried that, and, and you've heard, I've heard foreign investors, they come and see us all the time. They're worried about it. What's happening in India? It, in, in a sense that the change in the tolerance that India is known for is like, will it, will it affect our economy? Well, I, I, I think, uh sentiment is swayed by iconic uh, iconic acts and actions and may not reflect the larger larger reality so there is a a, a sense in which we have to be careful about what we say uh, because it does get magnified and reflected all over the world including now <laughs> including now including now right. so uh, I think that's that's important to keep in mind. I think the finance minister has repeatedly said that this is uh, something we should be careful about, uh, and I think that's that's but, reasonable but, advice. But it's carrying on. The, I mean, what India's known for, the now suddenly become a country where there's is riven, there's lack of tolerance. It's a terrible change, isn't it? And how does it? How, it it's not stopping. Well, I, again, uh, I think the. Uh, issue is uh, what what uh, what you do about it, right. uh, and I and I think the uh, advice from senior members of the government. I'm going to speak for him because he, <laughs> he won't. Has been calm down, mm -hmm. uh, and certainly I think that's appropriate advice. That uh, across the spectrum we should calm down uh, because uh, I think that reflects, as you said, our our history and our our. Um, legacy of, of tolerance and, and openness. And it was a great positive of India which would be terrible to lose, right? I think it continues to be a positive, but we have to, you know, the price of uh, eternal uh, vigilance is the price eternal of civilization, vigilance is the price of, uh, civilization. Of civilization is yeah. the price of, tol uh, of freedom. And I think we just have to be careful that the extremes don't hijack the m much more moderate and existing centers. Now you can speak as yeah, though you're not in the room. Exactly. So I, I just want to say two things. You know, one of the things that actually the kind of research that both Raghu and I have done, you know, across the world, I think one of the, uh, you know, regularities is, is, you know, how countries manage, you know, social cleavage and social, 
you know, discontent yeah. is, is a key determinant of long run development. I, I think that's a regularity. That key comes determinant of long run yeah. development. And, and I think this is, uh, I think this is very well understood in government, outside, and I think, you know, everyone understands this. this is an essential prerequisite. Uh, and, and, you know, and that's, as Raghu said, the finance minister keeps saying this, that about, you know, uh, you know, we have a development agenda, we have to focus on that. Let's not get uh, distracted. I think the second thing I would say, again, something that both of you said, is that, um, you know, uh, these things that we have, the good things that we have, uh, are, uh, have to, no doubt we can't take them for granted. We have to nurture them, uh, you know, as carefully as possible. But I also think that, you know, one has, to, uh, one has faith in the essential resilience of what we have, that, you know, this is our strength, we will continue to have it. Yes, we have to work at it, but we'll continue to have it. And, you know, uh, and that bodes very well for, uh, you know, the media. But you term. condemn what's happening, do you? I mean, uh, Raghu, I mean, I, I think all of any, I think a anything that's uh, extreme or intolerant, I mean, no one has struck with including, you know, uh, 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 people, this government, all governments. Any, any questions on the, on the intolerance? The My question is to Dr. Subramaniam. Sir, uh, we recently had a Moody's report which also spoke about this issue. And if we look at a totally utilitarian perspective, regardless of the merits of the case as to whether what is happening is correct or not, it's going to be very difficult for you to be able to pass reforms like land acquisition or GST without being able to negotiate the Rajya Sabha. And this is only going to give the opposition a lot of fodder to disrupt the house. What is the government strategy to navigate across this perspective? Because I think this is far more important than looking at as to whether whatever happened is true or not. Those investigations can go on. For the economy as a whole, it's very important how, what the government is planning to how to negotiate the Rajya Sabha in the first place. That's very practical. <laughs> yeah, it's just that, you know... Uh, on I just want yeah. to clarify one yeah. thing about Moody's. It was Moody's analytical... They have two uh, parts of Moody. Moody anal analysis and Moody investment reform. That one does the ratings. It's not that that criticize. It's the Moody analytics. But I'm sure Moody investment listens to Moody analytics in the long run. Or maybe they don't bother. <laughs> Uh, uh, first, uh, as I, I mean, I think what Moody has said is, is the regularity from all the empirical research. I mean, so I, I think they're just echoing that. You know, I, I think your question is about political strategy, uh, and you know, I, I don't do political strategy for for anyone. You know, but I think the broader point is that uh, the final. Just a question. Yeah. If you think the political strategy was good, you'd say it's okay to do all this. No, sir. The so you're not saying that. Because okay. ultimately there's going to be problems from the other side as well. Industries yeah. are not going to come into your country right. if you don't. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. And, and I, think, I, I think but the broader point is well taken and it's something that the finance minister has said as well and something that you know that uh, uh, we need uh, to pass a, a legislative agenda. We have a legislative agenda and you know we need the support of everyone possible to pass that. So anything that needs to be done for that will be, will be, will be tried and attempted and done. The finance minister is saying it but is this being said with a loud enough voice? I know you're saying that a lot of people do believe that it's a wrong thing that's happening, but for us in the public, we're not hearing it enough. Do you think it should be louder? Question to me? Yes, yes. No, uh, look, I, I, th I think that we live in a world of 24-7 press. And so the press picks up some things and the press doesn't pick up other things. I, I think there's been a fair number of voices uh, recently from uh, government uh, which have been, uh, you know, articulating this, but also Mr. the Environment Minister talked about having said this way back, but it wasn't picked up. So it's very hard to, you know, pierce blame the media. Well, right. <laughs> I, I don't want to blame the media. I'm just right. saying that it's not clear when you say, "Have they said enough?" You know, I mean, is the signal gone out? Like we are talking about signals for industry on various types the signal to stop this intolerance and go back to India's most wonderful characteristic? I think it's important for all of us to keep saying this. Uh, we can't say it enough. Yeah. And, and if we keep saying it and keep the fringes out right. on every, every front, right. I think we will preserve what is vital to preserve in this country. And so I would say, you know, uh, they certainly have said it. I've said it, others have you said, said it, it yes. and we just have to keep saying and it, Arvind drown out it. the other voices, absolutely, drown out the other voices. Talked about the st uh, our growth rate and it's 7 to 8%, is that a credible, 
there is a the problem. The world is looking at, are you really growing at 7 to 8%? The whole world's growing at 25 China's coming down. And frankly, I don't see 7 to 8% when I look around your um, towns and countryside. Just let's have a look at some of the facts behind uh, the credibility of the new GDP data. First of all, we've got industry at a very slow growth, under 5%. Uh, we know also you talked about two bad monsoons. Exports are falling. Um, global growth is the weakest. And are we totally out of line since the crisis? We've ha talked about the bad monsoon. So how in the midst of all this gloom can we claim 7 to 8% growth rate? And the change, and I'm going to give you a real headline, uh, you know, slightly tabloid. Yeah. Uh, we go to the... The change that basically shook the world and shook a little confidence, our central statistical organization, a great organization. But when we had, by the earlier series, a 5% growth rate in 2013-14, then they revised it. And when you revise, you revise to 6.9. I mean, you can revise from 5 to 5.2 or 4.8 to 5.3 to 6.9. That's like a 40% change. That's like saying, our statistical methods are terrible and and there's no real justification so beyond the marketing advantages of going at <coughs> 6.9 7 to 8% there is a credibility problem with our data and when are we going to crack that credibility problem because we're not doing it everybody's talking about these figures are all I mean we know China does quite a lot of that but India we take the figures the government gives us. <laughs> <laughs> and then don't believe them. <laughs> so, so having been put on the spot uh, very nicely by my friend, uh, <laughs> I, I, I think that, uh, look, uh, I mean, I think the comparison with China... Uh, no, no, that's yeah, yeah, is, is, is a, See, uh, my view is Their that... Their data is better right now. Yeah. My view is that, uh, you know, the the establishment and the institutions we have for measuring GDP, the whole statistical thing, is uh, of impeccable, unimpeachable integrity. Right. Uh, uh, processes are, are you know, top notch. And in fact, the irony is that all this revision happened in order to get our uh, uh, you know, standards up to world class and to exploit you know, just a, a, a blitz of new information that's right. become available. Right. Right, uh, and so that was the, the revision. Now, um, you, you know, I, I, as I say sometimes that you know, uh, you know, processes can be great, but outcomes we're not always sure about. Right. So I think that um, I, my, my favorite example is, of course, you know, I, well, uh, it's politically incorrect. You know, uh, the, the United States did manage to re-elect Bush. I mean, you know, the uh, re-elect him not the first time, but you know, that's that's a different and story. Trump. Uh, yeah, now we know whatever. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, but but I think that therefore, uh, you know, when we assess this data, I think this is a, a, a first uh, level of revision. I, I think in order to get a, a handle on, you know, whether this makes sense or not, I, I think they're going to keep working at the data. I think they have to produce a historical series to validate it it's against. It's like the so many years have gone by. You know, no, you're right. CSO is a gr uh, the central statistical organizer, great organization, but always has been great. So 5% was like, okay, not bad. But now it was all right. wrong. Uh, I mean, uh, as Arvind says, we will know over time what we're missing out or whether we are overestimating. I mean, this is the best mm. we have to work with right now. Uh, that said, are we at two or one? No, I think most analysts would say, you know, there's a discrepancy this way, that way of about 1% in terms of growth at, at, at this point. And I think some of it has to do with, you know, what we think 7% look like given the old numbers and what industry feels 7% looks like now. And so it may be that the old numbers were wrong, right? Uh, and we were perhaps growing maybe a little better. But let, let's put all that but aside. You know, all the, uh, those uh, disaggregated, the industry growth slow, bad monsoons, two in a row, low no, exports, so and then 7 to 8%. So that's the so the truth is yeah. is the equation between the new numbers and the old numbers. I think Mr. Pranav Sen has mm. said this also mm. is not one to one. We're probably 
if we were to say what does this mean in terms of the old growth numbers, we'd go down a little bit from where we are. Right. So that, that I think uh, most statisticians would say. Now, which one is right? As uh, 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 I know has which said, one you think is right. No, as, <laughs> Arvind, as Arvind has said, the newer numbers involve better techniques. Mm -hmm. But in, more, GDP, more data, more data in GDP calculations, there's always heroic assumptions that are made. Right. And when you students go into the details, the entrails, and this is something that sensible economists should do, go and find out how exactly this stuff is calculated, and you will see there are places where you really don't have any data, yes, and yes. you have to make assumptions. Estimates, I know. Estimates. So, so in that sense, there is room for improvement, and over time, we will do it. Yeah. Uh, I have just a couple sorry, of things sorry, to add, add to that. Raise your hands if you've got any questions. I'll come See, to you after this. Uh, in addition to you know uh, uh, what Raghu said about you know uh, broadly, are we in the b ballpark? And you know there may be plus minus here, which which comes with all estimates, by the way, because of all the assumptions you have to make. But I think the one thing that sorry, one I have to correct you. Yeah. Plus minus is normal. There's no plus here. You're not above eight percent. Okay, okay, so it's minus. Yeah. Okay, okay. So okay. maybe it's an asymmetric uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, confidence band, yeah. as, as Sorry, they would say. On. But 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 I think that uh, uh, what we need to look at is also that, you know, how are things changing over time? You know, and you know, is fourteen fifteen better than thirteen fourteen? The data show that. Fifteen sixteen is better than fourteen fifteen. The data show that. So so when we look at numbers, don't just look at the levels which you know are subject to this, but also look at the change. Uh, and you know, and there I think the the, the data are pointing in the right direction. Uh, I, yeah, I think you know, uh, bad as you say the industrial say conditions are, we are a recovering economy. Yeah. We are recovering. Right? Yeah. And, 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 and uh, the last thing is that, again, you know, one number that I look at, you know, I, I pay a lot of attention to because it's actual uh, dollars and cents uh, or rupees in Naipa, I say, but in the, for the government, that uh, indirect tax revenue growth in the first six months, you know, it's actual, you know, hard money that the government collects, which can, it can only collect if, you know, underlying activity is doing well. And that number, even if you take away all the new things, that, new taxes that yes. have been added, yeah. that number is gr growing at a robust about 11 and a half, 12 percent. And if that number is right, that means the underlying economy is, you know, recovering. Well, is that's nominal, robust. right? Yeah, yeah nominal. Mm -hmm. But remember, that's uh, but nominal GDP is, is is you know we're trying to infer nominal GDP from there, and because inflation is down, that means that a lot of that is real GDP growth. Right, right. Inflation down or up, I'm still not 100% <laughs> sure. The other thing is that um, a lot of people are talking about, but before I ask that, I interrupted you. I think it's a little bit open. You can ask any question now. Uh, you were going to ask a question and I interrupted you. Go ahead. Yes, uh, so it was about the investors' sentiments. So you talked about openness to investments. You talked about make in India. But there's a lot of pessimism around the world about investing and doing business in India. So I want to know what's the take of our governor on so, this. So uh, a uh, key concept in economics and finance is risk and return, right? And people will complain about some difficulties in doing business in India. We all know there's more bureaucracy than probably we need. Government is trying to bring it down, but it's, it is there. Um, but at the same time, if you do erect your factory, you do make a lot of money. A lot of our foreign investors who've put factories into the ground here are very happy with their experience in terms of the profitability over time, right? I mean, look at successes like Maruti Suzuki and uh, Hindustan Lever and so on. So what is key is, yes, it is difficult. It's not Scandinavia. But where can you get seven, eight, six, whatever, some high number. <laughs> don't, don't go too much below. So. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Where can you get that kind of growth in the world today? So they're really attracted by those things. And once they learn how to do, how to put the factory into the ground, this, that, many of them are very happy to expand. Yeah. So I, I think the, the, the answer is yes, a little more difficult, but the opportunities are also greater. There is some risk, but there's also a lot of return. And one of the things we have to sell about India is people have, in fact, made money, even right. when our growth rates were, were moderate. Right. 
I, I would Probably say more I, than China. A lot of people yeah. have lost money in China, but yeah. they make money. Here. I would say a couple of things. I, I think that, you know, at this stage, I, I think on balance, uh, uh, my sense is, and I may be wrong, you know, foreign investors are more, you know, kind of optimistic and gung ho about India, at least in a relative sense across the world, than most other places. So, so I think the second thing I think in all this, and and Pranoy, j'accuse, I, I accuse you of, of of this, is that. We forget that there's this whole new part of India, this technology, dynamism, startup, you know, fabulous, that energy fabulous. that, you know, that, and, and maybe we're too, too much, you know, enthralled to the old economy of Absolutely. manufacturing no, industry. It's a fantastic. Yeah. yeah. But again, and, will, and, we, and, get, and will people, we get an Alibaba over here? No, but we, we, look, uh, this is, what's it, 300 billion dollars? Look at company? Paytm, for example, oh, yeah. I mean, it's going. This, this, uh, is, yeah. this is so appropriate to India, right? I mean, look at, the costs of setting up a huge shop in, in one of the metros, enormous today because right. of land prices, right. uh, etc. But having a warehouse, servicing many towns, e-commerce, e -commerce, yeah. it's, it's the ideal solution. Right. So in a small town, somebody you know, looking yes. at the net at all these goods and they get access to them today, which they'd never had before. Now I'll give an example of a, a lady in Surat who middle-aged ladies design saris. She used to work for years going to one wholesale after the other, re retailer saying, can you put my sari, put it here. They treat her badly. They, she was really finding it tough. You know, nobody can see my sari. She's put it on one of these e-commerce sites. She makes 20 crores a year now yeah. without asking anybody for favors. So it does affect the ordinary person, the entrepreneur. So, so I think I think so. Let's not lose sight of this really dynamic part of India. I mean, I'm not saying that this is the answer to all of India's you know challenges. Uh, I think manufacturing and make in India, the, you know, kind of. But this is huge. Uh, yeah, have an important role to play. But I think there's also this, you know, huge wealth of dynamism, talent, yes. technology exploitation yes. that yes. I think is so. So I mean, uh, Raghu and I wrote something long ago called you know the churn, the churn of India. I think this I think exemplifies yes. the. the yes. You know the churn of India, but you know I hate to say it. Even here, there's a little bit of the structural problems, the rules, regulations. People, you can't only have a marketplace. You can't have a warehouse. You've got to have. Oh gosh, that needs to be sorted out. We have to learn from other countries. Just copy, well, or be inspired. I, I, I think uh, both the regulators, the, the central bank, and the government are have the ears are open aware of this. and and are working on <laughs> this. So. Okay. Uh, for example, we've spent time with entrepreneurs trying to figure out, okay, what is it that makes you go to Singapore right. and, and, right. uh, and incorporate there as opposed to incorporating here? What are the things we can fix? Right. And some of them we can fix directly. Some of them will take a little bit of time because they're tied to everything else. Right. But, but my sense is we are well and truly convinced that we need to make the business environment easier here. Yes and have better regulation, not no regulation, no, better. Course. What better, is appropriate, tougher, yes. lighter but well enforced. Yes. Whatever well we enforced. have on the books, right. we have to enforce. Right. And right. in fact, that was, you know, one of our right. so-called so tips was with a company which was violating FEMA rules. Right. And in order to give an easier sort of service to the customer, and we said, stop violating the rule. We figure out a way either to change the rule or find new new ways of meeting Making the rules, able to do yeah. it, which yeah. allow well, you to very, do it. That's, uh, that's, the, uh, that's yeah. a wonderful, refreshing way to look at something. Yeah, I, I think just to add to that, I would say that, you know, regulation, lighter, better. But, you know, in all these new swathes of the Indian economy, maybe there's a huge role for government in action as much as there is for action. Correct. <laughs> Correct. That's generally true, by the way. Every day, the parliament, we lose a day of work in parliament. Many people say it's a gain for the economy, for the country. No, that, no I didn't mean less that, government. But, but, but I mean, but, <laughs> you I mean, don't say anything. <laughs> don't say anything about that. But there is one other issue which a lot of people are raising. There's a saying, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Now the RBI has worked beautifully for years. You've got a great RBI governor right now. The world admires him. 
why do you want to create this, what's it called, PMC, MPC, the Monetary Policy Committee and start interfering in his work? I mean, it ain't broke. Actually, let me interrupt there. No, 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 I, no, no, no. No, no, I, I, I'll interrupt <laughs> yeah. because I actually want what the MPC. That? That's what I was going to say, yeah. I, I no, want you're the being MPC. so politically correct. <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> even he's laughing. <laughs> no, no, I, he, uh, no, I have been saying this for a long time. Right. It's actually something which I think is important to establish the independence of the RBI beyond personalities into, right. into uh, right. sort of uh, the future. Right. And the reason is, is really threefold. One, uh, when you have a committee, first you get multiple views. So it's not me, it's a bunch of people, all of whom have thought, and you get a collective view. Hopefully the collective view over uh, time will be better than any individual possibly uh, their views could be. Second, of course if you get the right individual, this that's is always the problem. That's the problem. But that's if it's the government appointing four out of four out of seven. The government has always appointed the RBI governor, right? Right. Has always appointed the, <laughs> and you know, good choices you must ap accept. Apart from always. present yes, company I, accepted. No, no, I don't know. Always no. <laughs> no, present but company expected. Not. It's been it's been a reasonably uh, good set of. Uh, well, I don't, don't know whether bureaucrats should be made. Bureaucrats should be made given such a. Uh, important technical post. I well, think they take five years to figure out what is all about. Dr. Y.V. Reddy was, was, was a, a no, great uh, yeah. governor. And, there are, and, of course, many. But anyway, the, that's besides, the point is that you get multiple views. Second, uh, what, what, what you have is six people. One goes off, six, twelve, whatever the number is. Is it six? I thought it was seven. Well, whatever the number is, uh, the government Not will announce the number. The number? It's, 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 a, it's, it's six. I, I, no, no, no. It's, it's being dis decided. It's being discussed. Yeah. So, so let's take. I let's we take. We're getting a scoop. <laughs> no, you're not getting <laughs> one it. little scoop. <laughs> let's take uh, whatever number it okay. is. Those people are going to be. Uh, one guy gets off. There's still n minus one left, who are going to be the the source of continuity. In monetary policy, it's very important you understand what the central bank is but up to. But the independence of no, the so governor I'm coming, is crucial. No, no, I'm coming to the third point. Right. Putting pressure on six people is much harder than putting pressure on one person. So you just told me the plight of the industrialist. Now mm -hmm. I go home and think about it right. and say, right. no, how do I address this, etc. Et the cetera. five others may say. Yeah. So different people may have yeah. different views. So the point I'm trying to make here is that this will actually secure the independence. Now, the point about who appoints, et cetera, is important for important, continuity. And, important. and I think we need to work out, and, and we have broadly a consensus with the government on how this should go. Of course, this has to go through cabinet and then through legislation, and there could be modifications along the line. But I think there is broad agreement, and the government is very supportive of this process. So. Uh, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, I just want to uh, say that you know, from the government's point of view, I, I think there is no question that you know the RBI is one of our uh, you know really great and credible institutions. We intend to keep it that way, and anything that we do will be done jointly together, uh, and that's how we're proceeding. But you will so be able to overrule the governor, right? There's no we. I mean, there's be a, there'll be a monetary policy committee. It's church and state. <laughs> <laughs> no, the it it is a worry overall, and. Um, because it was functioning so well and you know I just feel that uh, I, the independence I, of the governor is so crucial. I, I think the, in, the governor will still be independent but I believe that if it's structured as we've, we've sort of broadly uh, it's revised a bit, discussed it? right. uh, that it will be uh, an independent right. entity. And remember again and again you see people appointed by the government but appointed to an institution. If they are people with integrity and typically they are they adopt the interests of the institution because they've been appointed to you know, run that institution according to its objectives. So it's not that there will be a, a, a string uh, uh, tying the, uh, the person who's appointed. I mean, that's true. The deputy governor in charge of monetary policy is appointed by the gov government. The governor is appointed by the government. 
But there have been differences between the government and the and the RBI so in the past. So it's not just that you were irritated, he wasn't no, no. lowering see, rates and said, now let's put a whole lot of people I, I there. <laughs> I, I think the way to think about this is the following. You know, Frank Fukuyama, you know, the guy who wrote yes, End of History, yes, yes. he has a very nice phrase, you know, the China good emperor, bad emperor problem, you know. So when you have individuals, mm -hmm. you don't know it's good or bad, right? Mm -hmm. I think what we're trying to do when is... When you have government involved, you know the truth. No, no. So what we're trying to do with, with, with I think, with the uh, RBI is, you know, preserve that good emperor thing, but also try and build an institution so we get the, the best of an institutional view and, 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 and an independent government. Does it remind you a bit of the judiciary versus the government where they tried to kind of change the appointment of judges and get interference and they were struck down? Are they trying to interfere? Are you trying to interfere in the long? I mean, it may be a good government now, good people, and it may work for another 10 years, but then no. rogue government comes in and then the governor is no, hampered. I, that's precisely why I think this new structure will be more independent of whatever the government, government is. Does. Because okay. you can't overnight change the entire structure. Right. Uh, right. People will have terms and so on. Yes. So there will be continuity in policy, Very both reassuring. when people leave and when new governments come in. Right. So having a, a target which the, you know, is, is, is sort of semi, uh, sort of, uh, is, which is stable, having a committee which is stable, all these I think are institutionalizing mm -hmm. a change which I think was very important for us. Fine. Last question, uh, you choose. <laughs> no, no, I mean, you know, ra randomize it. <laughs> randomize. Number three, you. Did you already ask a question? Okay, you're correct. Uh, broadly speaking, it is unprecedented that the government and the RBI are working, uh, are seem to be so friendly with each other. Now let's take this step a little further. Um, <laughs> it's not just about monetary policy. There have been previous government committee recommendations, such as the Rangarajan Committee, which has actually recommended that the RBI should consult the government on budgetary matters also. Why aren't we seeing more of this synthesis later? Why aren't, why aren't we seeing uh, a dilution of financial policy, of fiscal policy, and monetary policy Give in general? It's extraordinary what we're seeing today. Basically, you should write no. the budget with them. So, so uh, first, I think the differences between the RBI and the government, uh, I hate to say this again, but sometimes are too good press to, uh, <laughs> to, to sort of paper over. And so small differences or genuine differences in opinion are made into a personality clash into a, a, a deeper uh, juicy sort of juicy uh, problem. Uh, Not on NDT. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I, I've s uh, we have regular discussions, uh, not just the ones before the monetary policy. We have regular discussions with, uh, with government at all levels. And, and I think there is a very cordial uh, understanding, uh, you know, for the most part. A and uh, sometimes there are differences. There have to be. There have to be differences yeah. Yeah, because exactly. we are appointed to be different otherwise the, it could be run from yeah. north block uh, in, in fact right. that's what i was exactly going to say i think you should be uh, of course you should be very worried if we disagree you know on substantive terms you should perhaps be equally worried if we if agree about everything yes. you know if you don't disagree about things and i think that you know having that right and the second thing i would say is that you know even what you want that you know just as you know we have views on them they have views on what we do and you know we have a process we have processes in fact where you know these uh, get a chance to get uh, you know aired uh, reviewed, discussed, and so on. So I think that uh, that process, and in any case, you know, Raghu has my cell number and I have his. So I, I, I never pick up. <laughs> 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 I think the important thing is, uh, government, of course, has the right to replace whoever it wants in any of the institutions that it uh, uh, are, are are with it. But it also continuously says, "Here is what I think," but the decision is yours. Right? right? So the government can make its views heard, but it's important to let the entity to whom That's you're speaking the right make it. the decision. Right. And I think that, that culture, that tradition has built up in our country. It's, a, it's an important tradition, but and again and again. the government has no intention of changing that <laughs> at all. <laughs> 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 I think we've completely, we've, we've done our 20 minutes, uh, we've run out of time. <laughs> They just, there's one question which everybody asked me to ask you. One thing you'd like to see in the budget that he should do, and one thing you'd like to see in monetary policy that he should do, and then we'll end. Our 23 minutes will be over. Oh, God. Uh, you know, I look, uh, what do I? I have to think about let it. Him, I, let him I just you fire first. 
you know, uh, I, again, I, I'm, uh, you know, maybe things are too harmonious now that, you know, I, I can't think of, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, thing, you know, but I, I think that uh, this is an institution that, uh, you know, the government values. Well, one thing we should advise him to do, he may tell you to go jump in the... Okay, so th I mean, I, I think that, uh, uh, and this is not something that Raghu is not doing, and I think that, you know, being watchful over the, you know, the Indian competitiveness of the Indian economy and the exchange rate, which you... Uh, a, raised as a concern. It's a key area he should. Yeah, work. that's something that, and it's not that, you know, I think Raghu's, you know, yeah. watching it carefully, but I think that's something that I would yeah. pay particular uh, attention well, to. Well, well. this is uh, obviously something the government is trying very hard, and I'm not saying this uh, just because it's already doing it. But I think passing GST would be such a strong signal, not just to the domestic economy, right. but to the global economy, right. that we're willing to overcome whatever difficulties, uh, uh, you know, whatever that differences there are. This is way beyond politics. This is beyond politics. This is about stabilizing and ensuring growth oh, going forward. It's crucial. So I think, I think GST, but they whatever, trying that. whatever form, that's what I said, they're trying hard. But Some I think things they're not trying which they should try? Uh, well, I think th this is plenty to, <laughs> to do yes. this. If they can do uh, GST, yes, I think it would send a huge signal. It would also buy us enormous protection against any volatility that comes from the external thing because we as you said we are passing through difficult times we are a recovering economy right. but times aren't great to send a signal like this Wonderful. would be fantastic yeah and, and i just just to add to that i would just say that you know that's a message that's not only true for government but for all sections and all parties that you know in, in the spirit of true inclusiveness yeah. and putting the national interest above you know narrow uh, things yes. I, I think that would be a very uh, i would endorse what he said wonderful to hear the two of you thank you very very much thank you thank you very much